Call it an economic miracle. 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 Economic It's such an honor to be here with you all today. I'm really excited to talk to you about behavioral economics and specifically the intention action gap. I thought I'd start by uh, sharing a, a very personal, very recent experience with an intention action gap that I had. Um, it all started a couple of months ago when I was asked to present at Switchpoint. I had this great idea about what I was gonna do. Um, and if you asked me a couple of months ago how it was gonna play out, I would have said that I'm something like a Liz Lemon. I'm equal parts competent, a little bit neurotic, and sometimes I do things in funny ways. If you ask my parents how I do things, they're pretty much impressed whether I do something or if I do nothing, so they would have told you I'm like Hermione Granger, this magical whiz kid of making presentations. If you ask my colleagues, they have a different perspective of what I do. I'm a little bit demanding, but also I can be cool, calm, and effective. And I like to have this idea that maybe you think presenters uh, are poised, they're calm, and they prepare with plenty of time in advance. Well, what I'd like to share with you, and it's a little bit of oversharing, is that um, things didn't actually play out that way. So I'm gonna run you through the real timeline of events. <laughs> Starting from four weeks ago, three weeks ago, <laughs> two weeks ago, and then last week. I promise this, these, are, these are real pictures from my life. Um, and so really what the last few days have felt like is just this, um, a little bit of turmoil, a little bit of a roller coaster that I inflicted upon myself. Um, and I promise I have a point to this, which is that uh, I, I think my montage sums up behavior in three different ways. First, perceptions and expectations don't always correlate with reality. The second thing is that everyone has biases, even if you're a behavioral scientist like me, and you think about this, you live and breathe it every day, it doesn't make me any less human. And the third thing is that even, even behavior, behavior is not that simple. We can't just say, I think I want to do something, and then I'm going to do it. It doesn't always work out that way. And that's because everybody has biases. We're, we're a little bit quirky. We're a little bit inconsistent. Just look at these two athletes. <laughs> Um, that are taking the escalator on the way to the gym. I think that that's a little bit unusual, but I think uh, neoclassical economics and traditional approaches to behavior have often overlooked these, these quirky aspects of our, um, of our humanity. Uh, neoclassical economics assumes that just because you value something, you have enough information about it, your behavior should re reflect your preferences. What we see in real life is actually you can't infer someone's preferences by their behavior necessarily. They might not be acting in line with what their intentions are. This is the intention action gap. Human behavior um, is incredibly complex and behavioral economics seeks to unpack those complexities. Uh, many of these complexities arise because of our own human tendencies. And I want to, instead of recapping all of the abundant literature that exists in the social sciences, um, I was told not to bore you to death this morning that there wasn't enough coffee, so rather I want to do something a little bit different, which is um, I'm going to show you some figures on the next few screens, and um, to make sure that everybody's awake, I'd really like to ask your participation in saying the color that you see. So we can start together with this first one. So this color is... Oh, come on, guys. <laughs> if I have to... All right, ready. Black. All right, what happened? Come on, guys, what happened? Um, so many of you saw the color red, um, but the impulse to say blue was difficult to overcome. This is an example of the executive control function. In order to be able to override that well-worn neural pathway to uh, read the prompt blue, you'd have to exercise some mental effort. Um, and behavioral economics is, is um, the study of these types of inconsistencies, and for me this is incredibly powerful because um, I, 
I designed this presentation, granted in the past few days, with the idea that you guys would say blue, or at least some of you would say blue. And for me, this is exciting and powerful because once we recognize that we're inconsistent and we're quirky, we can also see that a lot of these things are pretty systematic and predictable. And knowing that about ourselves is really giving us the power to design better. Um, so once we know that we're inconsistent in these systematic and predictable ways, we can design better so that people can overall do better. When you look at the many different challenges that so many of, of you here work on, um, the consequences of intention action gaps are actually incredibly consequential. Oops, just pretend like there's still words on that slide. Um, many of you have, have built on, uh, many of you have worked on many, on many challenges that have intention action gaps. So there's been incredible advances in medicine and technologies. But what we find is human behavior is really that last mile challenge. How do we get people to follow through, to take up the medication that will be good for them, to use the technologies that could be life-saving life or, or um, increase their well-being overall? Um, and, and at Ideas42, we've really been studying human behavior for years to try to understand what is it about human behavior that prevents us from following through on our goals. Um, and we, we've taken what we've learned in the lab in many universities and we're trying to apply it to real problems in the world. For example, uh, Ideas42 is working uh, in partnership with IntraHealth in Senegal on three different projects. One of the projects that we're working on is looking at this challenge that postpartum women, uh, postpartum women don't use family planning. Um, many women, about 85% of women know uh, what family planning is. Many have this desire to space births every two to three years, um, and many women are inclined to use family planning, yet we still see that one out of four postpartum women has an unmet need for family planning. Why, why does this happen is a question that we wanted to ask ourselves. So we, we partnered with IntraHealth to build on the fantastic work that they've been doing with the, the Ministry of Health um, to try to reach women at immunization touch points. So what IntraHealth learned is that women, almost all women, have at least one touch point with a health facility, and that's to bring their child to immunization. This is considered an opportune time to share, women, share with women information about family planning methods, its benefits, and how it can help them reach their desired fertility preferences. Um, so, so integration of, of family planning and child immunizations can potentially be powerful. But what we found together with IntraHealth is that Sometimes this information is not enough. Um, so for some women, it does help get them in the door to take up family planning, yet some women still don't follow through. Um, th this notion that information is not enough, um, it's, it's necessary but not always sufficient, uh, we see in other health sectors. So um, how many people know what flu shots are? Raise your hand. Okay, how many people think that they, raise your, keep your hand raised if you think that they're important and valuable. Okay, keep your hands raised if you got a flu shot in the past year. Okay, some hands, about half of the hands went down. I know people in the front can't see, but I will say health audience, so I'm glad to see that a lot of you <laughs> uh, still were able to get flu shots. Um, why does this happen? Why is it that only two out of every five Americans um, get, gets a flu shot? One of our academic affiliates uh, wanted to study this question, and she, she believed that there was something more going on than just people don't know about it and they don't value it. Um, she thought that maybe people might be experiencing time inconsistent preferences. That is, people like me were procrastinating or they might be forgetting or simply just not making a plan to follow through. And she wanted to test this notion and ran an experiment um, some people she gave just information about the availability of the, and the details of the flu clinic. And another group of people, she gave that same information, but then also asked them to write down the date and the time that they would be going to get their flu shot. And she found, she found that just with that simple intervention, she was able to increase flu shot uptake by four percentage points, or 13%. And just with that small cost-effective modification, she was able to reach so many more people. It didn't really cost any, any more than the simple information in, intervention. Um, and when you think about that at scale, maybe 13% doesn't seem like a lot. But when you look at the millions of Americans and maybe even worldwide, people, uh, people that are not uh, taking advantage of beneficial medicines, um, this, this type of simple, uh, pretty easy to implement intervention can have an impact on thousands, maybe even millions of lives. So Ideas42 is working to uncover these types of insights by applying 
our five-stage methodology. It's an empirical and iterative process that allows us to be adaptive learners um, for every different context that we work in. I won't walk through each stage of the methodology, we don't have enough time today, um, but I do want to highlight a couple of pieces of our approach. So in order for us to overcome our own biases as we do this work and not projecting our own assumptions about what might be driving the problem, we, we have a process of inquiry and um, in, our, in our behavioral diagnosis, we go out and we talk to people. We want to hear their stories. We want to listen to this nurse and this health worker and understand what the true context is that they're experiencing. Um, and we really try to align ourselves with the perspectives of the individual decision makers. And that's really the essence of our user-centered approach. We want to make sure that we're seeing the world as the individual decision makers are. We don't just do this once to talk to them once, but we go out multiple times. And when we, once we've uncovered insights, we go through a process of user-centered design. We come up with different prototypes and we user test. We user test our designs in the field. Um, in addition to user testing, we also, um, Ideas42 has a firm commitment to evaluating all of the work that we do. We really believe that you have to test in order to learn. Um, and Part of that testing is being able to fail, so being able to know that this worked and this does not work. The power of what doesn't work is also as useful to us in developing innovations as knowing what worked. Um, so I, I won't share with you all of the details of our design today. I'll leave you with a little bit of a cliffhanger <laughs> um, and also an invitation to engage with Ideas42 and IntraHealth about our work um, in Senegal. We would be so happy to share with you. Um, but I do want to leave you with one parting thought, which is um, something that just some genius came up with. And he said, um, we can't solve our problems with the same thinking we used to create those problems. And at Ideas42, we believe that behavioral economics is a way for us to shift our thinking and really elevate our mindset about um, the human condition. And through that understanding, solve the problems that were created by our own tendencies. Thank you so much.